worthy to celebrate the exaltation of your glorious cross with sacred hymns and psalms. When you appear on the last day and the sign of your cross will shine brighter than the sun, gather us before you and surround us with your eternal light that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. raise glory, honor, and praise to the Savior who made the wood of his cross a strong fortress for his flock and established it as a sign of the covenant for the salvation of his inheritance. By his cross he exalted his church and gave joy to all people who believed in it. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. <clears throat> o Christ our God, by your precious cross you have given us perfect salvation and have made us worthy to celebrate this feast with hymns of praise proclaiming. Blessed are you, O wood of the Holy Cross, for you erased Adam's curse and restored his banished children to their inheritance. Blessed are you, O Holy Cross, for you have united heavenly and earthly beings. Blessed are you, O Holy Cross, for you fulfilled the words of the prophets Enlighten the apostles in their preaching, crown the martyrs for their faith, and honor the confessors for their loyalty. Now, O Christ, our Savior, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to make the celebration of the feast of the exaltation of your holy cross a sign of security and peace. By your cross, exalt your holy church, guide her shepherds, adorn her priests with virtue, purify her deacons, help the elderly, educate children, direct the youth, protect orphans, care for widows, and grant rest in your dwellings of light to our brothers and sisters who have died, hoping in you. 
May we find refuge in the shadow of your cross on the great day of your second coming, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever. Christ our Lord, accept these prayers and the fragrance of this incense that we have offered on the feast of the exaltation of your holy church cross. May its sign always be visible before our eyes to strengthen us, that we may walk with you toward death. And then stand at your right hand to celebrate the feast of your eternal victory. We glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Kadishat, Aloha. Sanctify our minds and purify our conscience. 
justice. God, we may praise you with purity and listen to your holy scriptures. To you be glory forever. sign of your cross, Lord, you ordain your holy priests, and they give us the mysteries through the power of your cross. from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and to children forever. So then, my beloved, obedient as you have always been, not only when I am present, but all the more now when I am absent. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for God is the one who for his good purpose works in both you, you to desire and to work. Do everything without grumbling and questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine like lights in the world as you hold on to the word of life, so that my boast for the day of Christ may be that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, but even if I am poured out as a libation upon the sacrificial service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with all of you. In the same way, you should share and rejoice your joy with me. Praise be to God always. For the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Shlomo Elokulchun, <coughs> from the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Saint Matthew, who proclaimed life unto the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls.
the Lord Jesus says, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones, when taking their lamps, brought no oil along with them, but the wise brought flasks of oil with their lamps. And as the bridegroom was long delayed, they all became drowsy and they fell asleep. At midnight there was a cry, Behold the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise ones replied, No, for there may not be enough for both us and you. Go instead to the merchants and buy some for yourselves. And while they went off to buy this, the bridegroom arrived, and those who were ready went into the wedding feast with him. Then the door was locked. Afterwards, the other bridesmaids came and they said, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. And he said to them in reply, Amen, I say to you, I do not know you. And therefore, be vigilant, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This is the truth, peace be with you. Praise and blessings to Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, for giving us His word of life. Praise and blessings to Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, be vigilant, for you know neither the hour nor the day. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen. In the Latin tradition, oftentimes in the spiritual life, it is founded upon a juridical sense, which is not wrong, but the idea of sins, mortal sin, judgment, and this aspect. In the Syrian tradition, the spiritual life is based upon the sabro tobo, the good hope that we sing at the beginning of the liturgy. What it is as John the Solitary writes, and John the Solitary was a writer in Syria around the area of Apamea. Apamea is the place where in the mid fifth century, so he's in the same area where at the same time is founded Beit Marun by the emperor Marcion. So he's writing in the mid 400s. So he's writing a few decades after the death of St. Mary. And he encapsulates the Syrian vision, which is that the spiritual life is based upon the good hope looking to the life of the resurrection, the life after the resurrection. Always this vision of the end of the world that is throughout all of the prayers, the anaphoras in the Syriac tradition. So we, might, we very much live in this world. We have an awareness of sin and we have an awareness of virtue. But the virtues are being practiced because there is a glory of that great wedding feast coming. That day of the resurrection. That is our life. Not here below, preoccupied. But vision already towards in the Sabro Tobo of good hope, of the life following the resurrection. And in this beautiful vision, it's precisely the meaning of this parable today, of the ten bridesmaids. So in the Oriental tradition, in the Syrian tradition, in the Middle Eastern tradition, weddings are done in two stages. So you have originally the negotiation, the contractual aspect. 
You have the exchange of gifts in the family, you make the contractual agreement, and that is the wedding. They're already wedded. You see it, and we'll talk about during the season of announcements, you see it even in the relationship between Joseph and Mary. So what our Lord is relating here in this parable is the second part of this marriage ceremony, where you have the first part, as we mentioned, the contractual aspect, and then you may have months that actually take place before the actual moment in which the marital entourage goes to the bride's family's home. And they bring the bride in all of her fine adornments, and there is the huge procession to her husband's house for the actual celebration of the marriage. And then, of course, feasting goes on for days. So in this two-stage motion, our Lord is in this parable bringing up the fact that by, his, by the bridegroom's death and resurrection, by our Lord's death and resurrection, that is your contractual agreement. That is the marriage has already been established. That the kingdom of God is already among us, that it is already present, that it is already on this earth as we progress in that good hope, in that sabro tobo, towards the celebration of that life of the resurrection. Nobody would ever think that the, that the marriage is done because we've done the contractual part. No, no, no. In fact, most people don't even care about that part. That's just done between the parents. We're waiting, we're waiting for the seven-day party. That's what we want. That's the vision of John the Solitary. How do the Syrians live? How do those Christians live? They live with this desire that we're waiting for the wedding feast. It is that Semitic vision of the book of Revelation. Everyone fixates upon destruction and plagues and stars falling from the heavens. That is not what the book is about. The book is about the wedding of the Lamb. The book is about the new Jerusalem descending from the transcendent infinite good one. This aspect of looking towards the life of the resurrection is exactly what's being played out in this parable. And so these bridesmaids, they're waiting. And the parable has the lovely detail. You know, the idea of time is kind of large. You say to somebody that you need a taxi at 8 a.m. in Beirut, and well, you know, it may be 8, it may be 8.30, 8.45, you know, it's not bad. So you have to plan accordingly to make sure you hit your flight. And so it's the same thing here. The bridesmaids are waiting. They're waiting for the coming of the marriage procession, the bridegroom. We're waiting for him to come to take his bride. They don't talk about the bride because that is the parable. You are the bride. You are the members of that church that is the bride of Christ. So she's not even spoken of in this parable. It's the people who accompany that church, the people who accompany that bride, who are members of part of the party. These are bridesmaids. Or yes, we say virgins. These are young women who are the bridesmaids to it. And some of them were told. We're told there's five wise and five foolish. This is the classic parable that comes up continually, echoed throughout hymns and imagery throughout the church in all the centuries. Because they do what every human being does. Sometimes just being scatterbrained and not planning for the future. Prudence wasn't there. And so what is also important to understand is this parable is recounting this period of time between that wedding of the glory of the, the bridegroom of his death and resurrection and ascension and the time that we wait for the celebration of that marriage. And you'll notice that all ten, even the wise, because this is taking so long. We're told in the parable they all get drowsy and they all fall asleep. Now, when we're saying our rosary, when we're in the pews, we're always saints, chorus when we're doing those things. But we're not always praying. We're not always paying attention. Sometimes we're shopping. Sometimes we're shouting at the idiot on the highway. We're doing different things that we're just not paying attention. We're certainly not focused upon the wedding to come. And those are the unwise virgins. They're scattered, they're not really thinking, but in fact, in the end, all of these young women fall asleep. 
The difference is, is that why are the others called wise? It's because of what they have done beforehand. They all, they're all snoring. They're all sleeping. And then we're told it's unexpected. It's in the middle of the night. Okay, now we're here and we're ready. You have to come out. We're ready for this procession. And when they get up and they wipe the sleep out of their eyes, and perhaps a bit of that drool, make sure it's not on my dress because we got to get ready for this party. They realize, oh, our, our lamps aren't very good. We're not ready for this. That moment that the bridegroom arrives, the Saburo Tobo had been more superficial for five of those young women. And the Saburo Tobo, the Good Hope, that had been the very direction of these young women, which is why they also brought extra oil. And so they're the ones who are ready. And so when we ask the question, well, what is this oil then? What is the parable actually supposed to be indicating to us? Well, it, of course, it indicates a whole series of things. But the primary understanding is the vision in which, by baptized and consecrated as we are in Christ, our lives are directed towards that celebration of the bridegroom. That our lives are directed towards virtue, towards justice, towards beauty, towards goodness. And not justice in this world, but the order of grace that transfigures us and allows us to go beyond our normal petty concerns, those distractions on the highway and at the store. And when we look at that, that oil, that unction that they have prepared to bring so that their lamps are not going out when the bridegroom appears, what we can put into the context of today would be the virtue of magnanimity. Magnanimity is not one of these modern virtues that is discussed. Magnanimity literally means great soul. Manya, great, big, anima, soul. And throughout all the Christian centuries, the notion of munificence, magnificence, magnanimity, these were central to Christian understanding of how we lived in the Saburo Tobo, in the good hope, waiting for the celebration of the resurrection. The things we do here below, oh, I have to farm, I have to go to work, I have to do those things, but those are not the center of my life. They may not even be very important in the long run. But everything else I do within that context, that has importance. That is the virtue of magnanimity, of greatness of soul. Its definition means the desire to do great things for the honor of God and for the salvation of my neighbor. That's all. That's all it means. The person who is magnanimous doesn't necessarily do great things. And I gave the example last night of the gentleman that I knew in Anchorage, Alaska. He practiced beyond magnanimity what was also known as munificence. Munificence is a virtue, but it's a virtue that can only be practiced by the wealthy. Because it, is to, it actually is to accomplish those things, to do those things. And this man with his wealth built Providence Hospital in Anchorage, Alaska. He built the hospital. And his name's not on it. It's not the Robert So-and-so Memorial Cent Mem uh, Medical Center. No. He gave all this to the sisters. And this was one of the few wealthy people I have known in my life who have stickyless hands. The money just flows through them. Profoundly wealthy, living in simplicity, in an apartment, and doing tremendous good things all around for the Church of Alaska. It was beautiful to see. That is munificence, to do and to accomplish great works for the honor of God and for the benefit of others, for the salvation of mankind. And we can't all have that virtue because we don't have the means to accomplish it. But we can all be magnanimous. Remember how we spoke about a month ago, or a few weeks ago, talking about the littleness of our lives, but the small actions in our lives, our prayers, and however insignificant we may think our lives may be, they're not. Because the order of grace transforms everything that we do in our lives in that vision of good hope. 
And even my little prayers, even the things that I may do, even the person who is lame, invalid, can accomplish great things. That is the story of St. Rafka. That woman did physically really almost nothing for the last 30 years of her life. And in fact, really nothing in the last decade of her life being paralyzed. And yet she is great and accomplished great things because she was magnanimous. Her soul was great, manya anima, and she had great desire to accomplish great things for the honor of God and for the salvation of her neighbor. And because they lived in the 19th century in which magnanimity was honored and cherished and practiced to the degree that we could, those other sisters knew that St. Rafka was that treasure house. And they carried that woman to the found new foundation of their new convent because she was going to be the central member. That is magnanimity. None of us have an excuse for not being magnanimous. And it means that even in the little things that we have in our lives, the little things that we do, we do them with greatness. This is the path of St. Teresa of the Sioux. This is the little way to do the small things in simplicity, but with great desire. This is why when you meet people who are truly profoundly religious, everything in their life is ordered. Everything has a place. Everything is streamlined. Everything is prioritized because ultimately it's all prioritized under God. They do not live in a mess in chaos and giggle when someone makes a comment about their desk. Well, yeah, it's just kind of that way with the dirty socks next to them. Because their life, that's a scattered individual. That is not magnanimity. And it's not about cleanliness or order. It's about the order within the soul, which is magnanimity. And all of that simplicity and all of that beauty, as I mentioned to you, that in the conversion of Dorothy Day, when she was still a Marxist, a Marxist sympathizer, she sent down as a journalist at the beginning of the 20th century to cover the revolution of Pancho Villa in Mexico. So when she's down there, she's just covering this. But what begins the process of her conversion is she notices the Mexican peasants. Remember, she's rabble-rousing for the proletariat. And she meets, she sees people. She lives down there for a number, I think months, covering this story, a year perhaps. But she lives there long enough to observe this peasant population. And she is profoundly moved by the nobility of their lives. They don't have two nickels. They have no more money than the proletariat in New York City. But their lives are noble. The proletariat in New York, squalor. There is a huge difference between these two. And that's what got this young, lapsed, Protestant, Marxist sympathizer thinking about what was different. These Mexican peasants were Catholic. There is a magnanimity in that dirt floor, single room peasant house that is swept clean that dirt floor every day. And that one tablecloth that may only be on the one little tiny table with beside the two chairs that they own, which is all they have, that tablecloth you know is clean and is pressed. Because they may not have much, but they themselves are great. That is the virtue of magnanimity. It makes you look towards the day of the resurrection and makes you flourish that sabro tobo, that good hope. And that is the unction, that is the oil that we take with us. So that even when we are distracted, and the day of the Lord comes and the festival of the resurrection is going to take place, we have that little vial next to our lamp. So that even if our lamp is beginning to flitter and to go out, we have that unction of a life that has been lived magnanimously in its simplicity of order and beauty and virtue and justice and goodness. And who knows? that in the practice of the magnanimity in your little home in central Maine, you'll come into contact with another of these forlorn and lost souls like Dorothy Day in those days, and they will have gone to your home and they will have seen beauty and they will have seen nobility and they will have seen greatness in what you consider perhaps to be a very simple life. And the grace of God will begin to work on another soul 
because they have met one soul that is great in magnanimity. That is the unction of the keeping of the extra oil with the lamp. That is the meaning why our Lord then says at the end, so be watchful. Live your lives awake because you do not know either the day nor the hour. So may that same bridegroom for whom we wait in that good hope and the glory of the celebration of the resurrection make each and every one of us in our days and all the minutes and all the hours of the days that remain to us before our death that they be magnanimous, transcendent in virtue and glorious in beauty. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
need to, Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you, out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the repose of Kathleen Hawes. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. with a holy kiss, that through Jesus Christ our Lord we may be your radiant and blameless flock. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to the Lord. before you and ask that you grant us in your mercy the riches of your grace and kindness 
May your compassion and assistance sustain us all the days of our lives through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people. We glorify and honor you, your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Holy God and Father, you sent your only Son to save us, for we are weak and poor. When we had gone astray, he brought us back to your spiritual fold by his royal blood. Through the grace and the favor of your only Son, we implore you to accept this bloodless sacrifice from our sinful hands, and through it to forgive our sins. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. Truly glory, thanks, praise, and honor are yours, O God, the Father, maker of all creation, with your only begotten Son and your living Holy Spirit. The angels, archangels, and all the heavenly hosts bless and praise you. They cry out and they proclaim. <coughs> Whenever you observe these commandments, you proclaim my death and resurrection until I come again. We ask for 
Jesus Christ, you remember your plan of salvation for us, your conception, birth, and baptism, your saving passion and life-giving death, your burial, your glorious resurrection and ascension into heaven, your sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and your royal second coming when you will judge all people and reward them according to their deeds. Now we ask you, at that fearful hour, have compassion on us and have mercy on us in your kindness and forgive our sins in your mercy. For this your church implores you and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father, have mercy on us. O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them, and because of them, we praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we profess our faith in you, and we ask you, have compassion on us, O God, and mercy on us, and hear us. How awesome is this moment, O my for the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Annin Morio, Annin Morio, Annin Morio, Nite Mororo, Hayo Kodisho, on the hand of the line of our Corbono. May these holy mysteries be for the forgiveness of sins, the pardon of faults, the honor of building and strengthening of your holy church, and the protection of her children from all sin. And may these holy mysteries allow us to stand with confidence before your awesome throne, that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, exalt your holy church established throughout the world. Protect your shepherds of the true faith in peace and security all the days of their lives, especially Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bishara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops, pious priests, pure deacons, and all who serve your holy altar. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, all those who call upon your holy name, Bless those who are near and bring back those who are far. Visit the sick and strengthen the weak. Release captives and assist the oppressed. Bring back those who have strayed that they may live in your fear and reward those who have brought offerings upon your holy church. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, our civil leaders and all the children of your holy church. Grant them security and peace, and keep domestic and foreign conflicts far from them, so that they may live in tranquility. Protect them by the sign of your living and victorious cross. Rescue the persecuted and the displaced of your flock, and be a refuge for strangers and a companion for travelers. Grant your eternal reward to monks and those who live solitary lives 
and to hermits who live on mountaintops and in caves of the earth, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, upon this altar and upon your heavenly altar, the holy and ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of God, the prophets, apostles, martyrs, confessors, and evangelists, John the Baptist, the forerunner, Stephen, the archdeacon and first martyr, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Marin, and all the saints. May we join in their ranks and share in their joyful feast. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the faithful teachers who have gone to their rest in the true faith, especially Peter and Paul, Mark, Clement, Ignatius, Dionysus, Julius, and all those who endured suffering and persecution for the strengthening of your holy church. Remember also those, also those who serve your holy altar and forgive their sins, that they may reach your joyful dwellings. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, all those who have left this world and have gone to you. Lead them to your joyful dwellings and blot out all their sins. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed, with or without full knowledge. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, it is now, and shall be forever. merciful and compassionate, you have sanctified this divine service and have perfected it in your good pleasure by the grace of your only Son and by the descent of your Holy Spirit. Sanctify us now that we may be renewed as your spiritual children so that with pure hearts and enlightened souls we may call upon you, O glorious Father and lover of all people, praying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Deliver us, O Lord, from every temptation of soul and body, and crush our enemy, the evil one. Grant us your mercy through Christ Jesus our Lord, for you are blessed and glorified with him and with your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Shlomo el kulchun. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of it, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, look upon your inheritance who bow before you, and guide our steps on your right path. Make us worthy to share in this sacrifice, and may it sanctify the souls and bodies of those who receive it through Christ Jesus our Lord. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your Spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility, and ask Him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for He is one in heaven and on earth, to Him be glory forever. Make, Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by Your holy body, and our souls purified by Your forgiving love. May our communion be for the forgiveness of 
Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, O compassionate and merciful one. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. God the Father, how can we who are unworthy thank you for your grace? For you have given us this divine gift and have made us worthy to share in the body and blood of your only Son who saved us. Through him and with him, glory and honor are due to you and to your Holy Spirit now and forever. Shlomo el kulukhunna wa amruho diloh. Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, you are worshipped and you are holy. Bless and forgive the priests who are the stewards of your people and of your holy church. Forgive the servers of your divine mysteries and all the faithful who have shared in this sacrifice. Care for orphans, help widows, assist the poor and the distressed, satisfy the hungry, and protect all who call upon your holy name in every place. 
May your name be glorified with that of your Father and of your Holy Spirit, who is good, life-giving, and consubstantial with you, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.